if anything, we could record. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, Careers in the U.S. Foreign Service event. Um, we're excited to have you, um, and thank you for joining us and coming to this BPA event. Um, a little bit more about Black Professionals in International Affairs. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization, and if you would like to join, um, feel free to head over to our website at iabpa.com um, to learn more information. Um, so first off, we're going to have a few opening remarks from Ambassador Sylvia Stanfield um, regarding BPIA and today's event. So take it away, Ambassador Stanfield. Thank you, Kyla. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Sylvia Stanfield. wellness, mental wellness, economic uh, outlook in Africa and climate change. This is all part of our focus on professional development and mentoring, education and exchange, and business and economic development. We're growing and we're thriving because of contributions of time and talent by our committed member volunteers, volunteers like Kyla Dinwood and Tyler Smith, university students and valued members of BPIA's communications committee. And they're also the creative host for today's informative program, an outstanding program with practitioners in the field of diplomacy. So with that, please visit our website, iabpia.org and join us. You'll be so glad you did. Thank you and now back to our host, Kyla, thank you. Great, thank, thank you, you so much, much Ambassador Stanfield. Um, and we're going to be moving this right along to our first presenter, Dr. Yolanda Kearney, um, for more information about joining the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service. Good afternoon to everyone, Ambassador Stanfield. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, Tyler and Kyla, thank you very much for hosting today. So my name is Yolanda Kearney. I am a Foreign Service Officer with the Department of State. I'm so happy to be here today with uh, Foreign Service Officers from um, our sister agencies of the Department of State. We have USAID and the Foreign Commercial Service, and also my fellow diplomat in residence, Nathan Bland. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the State Department's Foreign Service is structured. In typical government style, I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you. Don't be too dazzled here. By, uh, by what you're about to see. All right, so first I wanna tell you uh, what it is that the State Department is looking for. I know uh, we can Google just like, like you can, and we know what you say about us, and it, to an extent it's true. We have been pale, male, and Yale for quite some time. And so we are now looking for a foreign service that looks like the United States of America. This means we want you to bring all of your authentic self to the table, all of yourself. We're not looking for any more clones. We have enough of those. So what does that mean exactly? It means that Yolanda from a very small town in, uh, in Florida brings her rural experience and her rural background to the table when we're discussing the crafting of uh, foreign policy and the implementation of foreign policy. It means Yolanda with her three inches of, uh, you know, pandemic split ends and her natural hair can bring all of that to the table. So we're not looking for you to uh, filter yourself. We want you to bring your authentic self to the table. And uh, we want to do some myth busting today too. All academic disciplines are useful in the United States Department of State. I'll use myself as an example. Uh, my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in music history and literature. I was a music historian at the Library of Congress before I joined the Foreign Service. My doctorate is in religious studies. So while we do have lots of lawyers, lots of people who study international affairs as an academic uh, background, all academic disciplines are useful in the Department of State. We are the nation's oldest cabinet agency. We lead US foreign policy and diplomatic engagement. And our main purpose is to protect the interests of US citizens around the world. There's no place in the world where a US citizen might not find him or herself in peril. 
So quickly, who are we? We are about 77,000 employees, uh, about 8,000 foreign service officers like Nathan and myself, about 6,000 or so foreign service specialists. We have a civil service corps based in Washington, D.C. of about 10,000. For those of you who don't yet have uh, families, one day it may be important to you that your family members be able to work where you do. So there are some 2,300 or so eligible family members who work in positions domestically in Washington and in the United States and at our embassies and our consulates abroad. And I want to draw your attention to this number. There's 51,000 or so locally employed staff at our overseas missions. These are our foreign service nationals who are citizens of countries of our host, our host countries, and they work in our embassies and consulates. They provide the continuity in our embassies and consulates. They serve with us for 20, 30, in some cases, 40 years. We are in 276 posts in 191 countries around the world. For those of you thinking about interning with us, you should know that we have opportunities to intern at those embassies and consulates, also at our headquarters in Washington, DC, and also at our various field offices throughout the country. We have passport agencies, agencies in almost every state. We have a media hub that we host in uh, Miami. We have a uh, financial service center in Charleston, South Carolina. So a sick tour for us or a domestic internship may not necessarily be in Washington, D.C. We want to make very clear what it is that we're looking for. Uh, about 35 years ago, the State Department took a long look at itself and said, if we had to build the perfect foreign service officer, what would that look like? And uh, they decided it would be these 13 foreign service dimensions, which really any employer would want. But these are the things that we have found that will be the greatest predictor of success in the foreign service for the officer corps or the generalist corps. So uh, there is not a required degree of any sort to join the United States Foreign Service Officer Corps. Those who uh, have the ability to convey these 13 foreign service dimensions are those who will be most competitive and the pursuit of becoming a foreign service officer. There again is no uh, requirement for a particular degree uh, to join the foreign service generalist corps. If it were so, we would have just said, okay, well, we know that a predictor of success in the foreign service is a degree in X discipline and just have that discipline and come into the foreign service, not so. So remember this when you are applying for internships as well, and obviously for employment, we're looking for these foreign service dimensions. Very quickly, these are my flags. These are the countries to which I've been accredited and where I've served. I joined the foreign service in 2004 when some of you were babies, I'm afraid. Uh, at that time, Colin Powell was the Secretary of State and he was very much the face of our recruitment activities. I'm Grady Nikki Haley in the center uh, image there in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where she was our ambassador to the UN. And the last photo I keep in to keep myself humble, that was my first ever press conference as mission spokesperson. I am clutching that podium for dear life. I survived as did the podium. And now I also want to tell you about foreign service specialists. So there's the generalist corps, also called the officer corps, that we'll talk about momentarily. But also there are foreign service specialists. These are the people who provide uh, particular expertise when they join the foreign service. As opposed to the generalist corps, there are specific academic requirements that are um, that are required to to join as a foreign service specialist. For our information management uh, professional, for example, obviously they have to have backgrounds and certifications in IT. We have human resources officers, medical providers, uh, and psychiatrists, uh, which is to say we hire nurse practitioners, physicians, lab assistants, and regional psychiatrists also. Our special agents here, this is the image that I think most people think of when they think of diplomatic security. We have diplomatic couriers, engineers, someone has to be able to engineer and build these amazing embassies that we uh, create around the world. Someone has to maintain those embassies once they are built. Those are our uh, facility management officers and our office managers. So when you think about the Foreign Service, remember that our diplomatic colleagues are not only generalists and officers, but also Foreign Service specialists. I want to briefly talk about the five Foreign Service officer career tracks. 
The persons are consular officers. Again, there's no place in the world where an American might not find him or herself in peril. These are the officers who uh, provide emergency and non-emergency services to American citizens. If you've ever lost your passport when you've been abroad, uh, you may remember the friendly consular officer who helped provide you with a replacement uh, temporary um, passport to help you get home. Our consular officers also adjudicate visas to make sure that the people who are visiting the United States are only those who have a, a legitimate reason to visit. And for Americans who adopt abroad, these are the people who are on the front lines of helping to make that possible. Um, and then for the evacuation of American citizens, we just completed the largest evacuations of Americans ever uh, when we were bringing folks home for COVID-19 relief. Our economic officers do all the things that you would expect Ports, experts, trade, commercial advocacy, but also this is where you're going to find our Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Officers, ESTH. So if you have an interest in climate change as a policy issue, those are econ officers in the State Department. When it comes to uh, 5G, that global conversation about 5G, writing those policies and implementing those policies for our econ officers. Right now, our health officers are the ones who are looking at policy when it comes to COVID-19, Ebola containment, et cetera. Our management officers are essentially the chief operating officer of any mission. They're responsible for all things that make the uh, embassy run. So they manage our real estate. Uh, obviously, all of the uh, employees have to have some place to live. They manage all personal issues. They manage budgets. Um, they are essentially responsible for all things that make the embassy function. Political officers are what most people think of when you say a diplomat in the State Department. So CNN is going to tell you that there were tires burning outside of the embassy. The political officers are going to tell you what that means. If the tires are burning in front of the embassy because the opposition is um, mounting a coup, or are the tires burning because the teachers haven't been paid in four months and they're uh, protesting. So CNN and the cable news networks are going to tell you what. The political officers are going to tell you so what. Finally, in my own career track of public diplomacy, we're in two tranches. We focus on press and media operations uh, on the one side of the house and the other side of the house is our uh, cultural and educational programming. So if you have ever seen um, a Fulbrighter who has lectured on your campus, they were recruited and um, vetted and sent to the United States by a public affairs officer in an embassy somewhere. And those of you who are thinking about applying for Fulbright, you should know that those applications end up on a public affairs officer's desk. They're the ones who make those final decisions about Americans who are going to come into country to either research or to, um, or to lecture. And then obviously we work very closely with the press corps in country. I've chosen to uh, to work in Guinea-Conakry and Cameroon and the Democratic Republic of Congo because those are some of the worst jailers of journalists on the continent. It has been a very, very interesting career for me in that way because uh, press advocacy was not something that I initially planned to focus on uh, when I joined the Foreign Service, but I spent most of my career uh, doing so. So uh, finally, this is uh, how you contact me. If I am your diplomat in residence, uh, I cover DC, uh, Delaware, Maryland, and uh, West Virginia. And uh, later on, we'll tell you how you can reach your diplomat in residence. You will see those comments in the chat. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kearney. And now we're gonna move on to Jay Nathan Bland to talk more about career opportunities for students and how to get into the Foreign Service. Great, thank you, Kyla. So, um, and thank you, Kyla and Tyler for hosting us today. Thank you, Ambassador Stanfield for having invited us to this event. And once again, welcome to our colleagues um, from the other foreign service agencies, USAID and Department of Commerce. Um, and I'm glad that you, you all just heard from Yolanda who gave you a great explanation of what the foreign service is. I, um, I'm a foreign service officer myself, as she mentioned. I'm the DIR, the Diplomat in Residence, for the Central South region, for Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas. So if you're in one of those three states, I'm the person that you would reach. Um, to be able to find your diplomat in residence, as Yolanda was talking about, she just put it in the chat box. So you go to our main website, careers.state.gov, and she gave you the exact link. Um, there's a little link on the top that says connect, and you would, you would go there, you click on diplomats in residence, and you would see a map 
we have 16 of us throughout the whole country. Um, you would find yours and, uh, and then shoot them a message and you'll be well on your way to learning more about the Department of State and all of our careers and student programs. So um, I've been in since, about, since 2006 in the Foreign Service. I've served abroad in China, in, um, in Italy, in Belize, in Mexico, and also back in our headquarters in DC. So I kind of view my, my life in terms of lives. So um, when I was in China, I had a Chinese life. Like I, 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 I was speaking Chinese, you know, I was eating Chinese food. I was immersed in the Chinese culture, learning Chinese history. So that was my Chinese chapter of my life. Then I went to Italy and did the same thing. You know, I, did, I got Italian language training and I was, you know, learning and speaking Ch uh, Italian there in Italy, eating pasta and pizza every day, you know, seeing the Colosseum on the way to work every, every morning. Um, you know, and then that chapter ended and I, you know, I went back to DC for a while. Then I went out and I, um, I went to Belize, which is a, a Caribbean country, which um, if, you, if you know that part of the, of the, of the world, uh, it's in Central America, the only English speaking country down there. And so I had my Caribbean life, you know, for about three years I was there. Um, and then I went out to Mexico and had my, my Mexican life, you know, so you, you get the point. So, so that's one of the, of the coolest things about the foreign service. You can have different periods in your life. You're living, you know, you're learning different languages, living different cultures. It's, um, it's a pretty amazing career. How that all started though, um, for me at least, was with student programs. Our student programs are a great way to get your foot in the door um, towards getting a job in the foreign service or the civil service. So we have two sides of the house. We have foreign service, which are the people like us moving around every two to three years, you know, from, from post to post, embassy to embassy overseas. And we have the civil service that does the work domestically. So, so they do our same jobs in foreign affairs and other related um, job functions, but they do it based in one place, one location. So I'm, gonna, I'm also gonna show you a PowerPoint right quick to talk about our student program. But real quick, the three things that I think a student program does for you is one, it gives you the confidence to know that you can do the job that, that everybody else around you is doing. You know, so after you're there with your State Department badge and your security clearance and you're working alongside other diplomats, you, you will get to see that you're not much different than anybody else. And, and you, you can do this. You know, you're doing it now. Two, networking. It allows you to get in and meet a lot of people. And I always say that everybody loves to meet an intern. You know, um, you, you, can, you can use your intern status to go speak to almost anybody in the embassy, even the ambassador. Or, um, or if you're in DC to, to meet other, you know, high level officials just to learn about what they're doing. People love to meet an embassy. And also the experience, it looks good on a resume. A lot of our student programs are seen as stepping stones to making it into the foreign service or the state department later. And we noticed that a lot of people um, who are coming into the foreign service as new officers, a good number of them have some kind of student program behind them. They don't have to. But, but a good number do. And with that point, I also want to emphasize, I saw in the chat box earlier that someone asked a question if there are internships for mid-level career, career folks. Um, you have to be in student status to, to participate in the student program. However, um, you, can, you, you can and you should apply to the Foreign Service in mid-level in mid career status. Um, we, we really need to bring in more diversity. And, and the quickest way to do that is to bring in people who are, you know, are already professionals and, and ready to join the Foreign Service. So I do encourage anyone to take the exam. We have a Foreign Service exam. That's, that's how you get in. Um, and it tests those 13 dimensions that Yolanda mentioned earlier. I, I encourage you to take the exam and, and, and make your way in that way. That's the most direct way to get into um, So you you about the uh so first um we have the graduate school fellowships so those in my opinion are our most valuable student programs that we have um the pickering and the wrangle are the top two bullets you see there oh very similar in fact those three are similar but i'll tackle those two first it does
Well, it looks like um, Mr. Blend may be having some technical difficulties, um, but we'll go ahead and move on for the time being to Ms. Butler um, to talk about USAID careers opportunities. Thank you so much, Kyla. And hopefully I will be, um, All right. oh, is Nathan back? Mr. Bland, are you back on the line? I think so, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Hello? Yes, let's move on to Ms. Butler very quickly and then we'll check back with Mr. Bland later. Okay, great. I'm happy to jump in here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alexius Butler and I am the um, USAID Development Diplomat in Residence based out of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, USAID, for those of you who aren't very familiar with us, we are, we are different from State Department in the way in which we go about our outreach and as well as our assignments. Um, I have, um, there are only two of us that, that are DDIRs. And so if you're interested in learning more about USAID, you can, you can contact me directly. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are also USAID as Foreign Service Officers um, in other places around the world. And um, you can certainly get in touch with our foreign service officers as well to get more information. Um, I will do in true government fashion, I will also do my uh, do a, a PowerPoint presentation um, that will just provide everybody with a little bit more information on, on the work that we do. Sorry, let me go all the way back to the front here. Sorry about that. Um, so, one, as a Foreign Service Officer, I just wanted to highlight that for USAID, we do not use a Foreign Service Officer test. Ours is a straight application process. And just to give you all a little bit more information about my background, I'm originally from Atlanta as a product of a single mother um, who always worked two jobs minimum when I was growing up. And I didn't know anything about international development or working overseas or any of those things. All I knew was that I wanted to, to do something outside of Atlanta. I wanted to, you know, to do something bigger and I wanted to do something to help people. And that was kind of all I knew about what I wanted to do in the future. Cause I didn't hear about this kind of career until much later on. I actually joined USAID as a mid-career um, professional. So I transferred from a career working on the nonprofit side, still doing international development, um, but on the non-governmental side. And then I joined the agency in 2006. And since joining the agency, I have been, um, I've worked in Afghanistan, uh, Liberia, Iraq, Bangladesh, South Sudan, and Haiti. Um, and I've also done what we call a temporary deployment, um, longer term temporary deployment to, um, to uh, Kyr Kyrgyzstan, as well as to, um, to Botswana. So just a little bit. So you see my pictures here. These are from different posts that I was in. Um, but a lot, the, one of the biggest differences that I find with USAID um, and State Department is that we oftentimes are, we're looking at the beneficiaries because the work that we do particularly focuses on um, improving the situations in the countries that we're in. We have a lot of interaction with the beneficiaries, so the citizens of those countries. And for those of you who are not very familiar with USAID, I apologize if you can hear the lawnmower that just started in the background. Um, we are the lead US government agency working on foreign development. And so what we're trying to do, like I said before, is to really improve the situation in the countries that we're in, not only to make that country more stable and to reduce the need for them to have to utilize international assistance to address their challenges, but also to make them stronger partners for the US government. We work in over a hundred countries around the world. We don't have all the nice posts that you that, um, 
Yolanda and Nathan were talking about to some degree, but we, because we are a development agency, we're working in developing countries. And I like to tell people that in every single one of those countries that I've listed, that I was assigned in, even though they may not be places that people would wanna to go to vacation, I have found an extreme level of, of beauty in those places. And I've always enjoyed interacting with the people and the food and learning more about their cultures. And a lot of times these are places that you may not even have heard of before you're assigned to go there, but they're phenomenal places to be. We, the work that we do in all those hundred countries, it's less than 1% of a US national budget. And I like to highlight that also because people often assume that what we're doing is very expensive. It's not super expensive when you consider the return on investment that the US is getting for the amount of work that we're doing. And I'm gonna go through these slides really quickly, but if anybody wants any more information, feel free to, to follow up with me directly and I can walk you through a bit more information. Our workforce is also a bit different from State Department's in that we're certainly smaller, but half of the people that work for our agency are what we call foreign service nationals. And these individuals are citizens of the countries that we're working in. And that's partly because our foreign, our foreign service officers are moving around every two years or so. But we do have a, a small civil service component that's youth that's primarily based in DC. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that for everybody. As far as the challenges that we look at on USAID, we're often looking at you know, the bigger development challenges. And I'm not gonna go through all these in detail, but you know, as you can see, these are big issues that oftentimes will affect, specifically affect that country, but could also be affecting the region. And it could also impact the stabilization in the countries that we're in if they're not addressed. Um, and so as you see food security, that includes you know, providing food in the beginning like to reduce famine in some cases, but also looking at agriculture longer term. Um, energy is about electricity access, et cetera. Urbanization in countries like Bangladesh where you have 50% of the US population. So it's about 172 million living in a space that's smaller than the state of Maryland. There's a lot of other issues that come with that, right? You got health issues, you got social service provision, you've got, um, you've got environmental challenges. And then in this situation, you've also got overcrowding and illegal building practices that are not well regulated. And so that's where that picture comes from. Um, and so again, I'm not gonna go into these in super detail, but I do wanna highlight that USAID foreign service officers in particular come into the agency with a master's degree. And so for those of you who, are, who don't yet have your master's, um, I just keep that in the back of your mind. If you already have a master's degree, also note that we're not necessarily looking for any particular master's if, because we have colleagues who work in our education sector and they may have a master's of fine arts. Um, some of them will have been teachers, but not all of them will have been teachers. I am a democracy and governance officer in particular. My master's degree is a very broad general master's degree in international affairs. Um, I have colleagues who have a master's in geology, et cetera. And so there's a wide, a wide number of degrees that we're looking for, but for the most part, our staff will be working in one of these areas. So, you know, I've already talked a little bit about some of them, but just know that global health is 50% of what we do around the world. We have been at the forefront of fighting pandemic disease since our agency was created in 1961. Um, but we're also doing humanitarian assistance. We're also working on engineering and inf infrastructure in those countries, as well as environment, et cetera. So there's a lot of different issues that encompass the work that we do around the world. But if none of those, if you're not particularly interested in any of those things, we still have jobs that may be work that you may be interested in if you want to do international development. Our program officer positions tend to be the ones that are more the generalist positions, similar to what Yolanda and Nathan were talking about earlier. These individuals are kind of like a jack of all trades. They're expected to know a little bit about everything that we're doing, but they're not necessarily the, the technical experts on those particular issues. We also recruit for financial management officers, executive services officers. These folks provide like the accounting and the money side of what we're doing. The executive services, they keep the, the USAID mission running. They do human resources, IT, et cetera. Our legal officers are the ones who 
um, basically ensure that what we're doing on, in that country is legal by US law as well as by local regulation. And then our contract and agreement officers are the ones who sign the awards. So some of these may be of interest to you, but if you don't have a master's degree, I also wanted to put in a plug for our fellowship program that we currently have, which is designed to increase the diversity of our foreign service. It includes a funding of up, of up to $96,000 for a two-year graduate degree anywhere in the US, any degree that you want. You do have to make the argument of why that degree is relevant to international development, but we're not limiting the types of degrees that you can pursue. Um, it also provides for two summer placements, one on Capitol Hill uh, for 10 weeks and another one overseas at a USAID mission for 10 weeks. And all of that is paid. Uh, so you will get a salary during that process. And then at the end of your fellowship, once you graduate from your master's degree program, you would then be sworn in as a USAID Foreign Service Officer. So it's a great opportunity for those of you who are looking at ways that you can increase your, um, that you can look at entering the agency. So just quickly, I also wanted to walk you through, um, I'm not gonna go through the characteristics of successful applicants just because I don't have time, but I'll happily go into this with anyone else. But you know, this is the information here. If you're interested in it, you do have to have a 3.2 GPA. Um, and we do look for people who have who have already um, had some international experience, although it's not a requirement. If you've worked um, on development issues or domestic challenges here, you're still, in, and you wanna go overseas to do that, this fellowship might also be a really good one for you. And quickly, only because um, we didn't have a chance to go through this in detail with some of the other uh, presenters, I just wanted to talk through some of these programs. And these programs in particular are ones to enter for us, the civil service. So you will, uh, and you can convert later on if you decide that you want to convert to foreign service. But we have the Pathways Internship Program, which I think Nathan was going to talk a little bit about. It's a federal program. USAID is one of the participants. This year, for the first time, we're planning to begin sending some of our Pathways interns. We're looking at how we can send them overseas. We're going to be doing virtual internships overseas with our Pathways interns. So that we'll try it out this summer. But in the future, I encourage all of you to follow, uh, follow these applicant, these, um, this internship process um, and stay engaged. And the best way to apply for any USAID program, as well as the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, is through usajobs.gov. Uh, for anyone who has any more questions or anything, I'm happy to stay on the line. But these are some additional opportunities for um, that are available if you're looking at doing some internships with USAID. We do have some unpaid internships as well, which I'm always not, I'm, I'm very much an advocate for paid internship opportunities and we are creating additional paid internship opportunities. So I encourage you to stay in touch with me if USAID is the agency that you're interested in going to. And I'm gonna stop talking now so we can hand it off to the next speaker. But these are the websites for further information. My email address is here as well. Um, and thank you so much for having me today. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Butler. A very insightful presentation. And now we're going to go wrap back around to Mr. Bland um, to learn more about uh, US state opportunities for students. Thank you, and I apologize for that. That was, um, was quite embarrassing because I sat here and listened to everybody else and I never got cut off, but then I started speaking and I get cut off. But anyway, I'm, I'm gonna run through this kind of quickly because um, I know we're over time. So as I started explaining, the graduate school fellowships to me are our most valuable ones. So uh, the Pickering and the Wrangle, what they do for you is they pay for two years of graduate school. They give you two paid internships, one domestic after your first year of school in the summer and then one abroad after your second year of school um, abro uh, abroad. Um, and they give you a guaranteed job when you finish, after you graduate. So you come into the Foreign Service as a Foreign Service Officer Generalist with a five-year work commitment. How to apply for this? You, you do it the fall before you plan on attending graduate school. So if you were planning on attending grad school in the fall of 2022, then you would apply this upcoming fall, 2021, at the same time you're applying for graduate schools. Um, the Foreign Affairs Information Technology Fellowship does 
a very similar thing, but it's for IT related majors. It'll, it'll pay for two years of school. However, you can apply for it as a sophomore and have your junior and senior year paid for, or you can apply for it as a senior and have two years of grad school paid for. And then um, it gives you two internships, one domestic and one abroad. And um, it gives you the guaranteed job when, when you finish. When you finish school, you come into the foreign service as an IT specialist with a five-year work commitment. So those two, if you know the foreign service is, is the route that you want to go, these are the types of fellowships you should be looking at. The Wrangell Summer Enrichment Program. This one is actually seen as a stepping stone to, to going towards that Wrangell Fellowship. But it, what it is, is you apply as a sophomore or a junior. Um, and it brings you to DC, to Howard University, in fact. Um, and you get to study two courses while you're up there and you get to meet a lot of people who are in the global affairs field. So, and, and most of these application periods will be in the fall, um, going towards the early part of the, the next year. So January, February, but most occur in the fall. Um, then we have our unpaid internships. So you have to be a, a junior on up to grad student. Um, the thing I want you to notice about these is that the application deadlines for the semesters are far in advance because you have to do your background clearance and all of that. So if you for our summer interns who are starting this summer, they actually had to apply by last September. OK, um, and this program is actually changing, maybe changing soon. Um, there, there are bills in front of Congress now that may uh, require State Department to make all of our internships paid. So, so we're waiting to see how that plays out. But we are, we will be moving forward still with the fall internship program pretty soon. Then um, the US FSIP, that's another very good one. Uh, the application period will open in the summer. And these will open, um, you should make sure you check out our site, careers.state.gov, um, and, and you'll, you'll find out more information about these. So the US FSIP, the US Foreign Service Internship Program, that one is both merit and need-based. And what it does is it pays for um, two paid internships, similar to the fellowships, where you get one domestic, and then the next summer you would do it abroad at one of our embassies or our consulates there. So that, that's another good one. Then we have the Virtual Student Federal Service Program. This is not just for state, but for um, but a lot of offices and embassies in state do participate. You apply during the summer and you, um, you, you'll you do it during your school year. You'll do a virtual internship, 10 hours per week during your school year. Then of course we have study abroad opportunities, which I highly encourage you to look at these as well. S studying abroad is a, is, is a great way to get that international experience. And we have programs to help you pay for it, to help you do it. So the Gilman Scholarship is for Pell Grant recipients and active duty military dependents. And it helps you if you're interested in studying abroad, It'll pay for up to $5,000 towards your study abroad expenses. Um, and then if you're studying a language on top of that, it'll, it, you can apply for an additional $3,000. So that's, that's a good one. And then the critical language scholarship, if, if you wanted to study uh, a harder language, a critical language that the government needs. So I'm not saying like you wanna go study French in Paris, but say you wanna learn Portuguese or, or Russian or Chinese or Arabic, you know, you can apply for this scholarship and it will send you on a intense study abroad period for like 10 weeks of intensive uh, language study. And then there's born scholars and fellows. Scholars are for undergrads, fellows are for grads. This is where you, together a proposal of, of something you want to study abroad, a certain language and, a, and, and a, an area of study and, and where you want to study. And then you put together the budget and you make a proposal. And then the, the Boren Committee will decide whether or not to fund your proposal. So in all of these, as I mentioned, they are seen as stepping stones. So, so people, when they, when they do the foreign service exam, they, they like to reflect back on their internship experiences, their fellow experiences their 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 study abroad programs you know and that that goes a long way towards meeting some of those 13 dimensions um last is what you were just hearing about from miss alexius but they're just now about the pathways program so there's three different pieces to the pathways program the pmf presidential management fellow the recent graduate program and the internship program the pmf is for grad students in your last year of graduate school, this is when you would apply for the Presidential Management Fellow. And what it does, and, and these, all of these pathways 
are, are seen to bring you into the civil service side of the house, not the foreign service side. So these are pathways to get into the civil service of uh, the State Department and other parts of the government. Um, the PMF, it'll bring you into your a home office and then you can you get a lot of leadership training while, while you, it's a real job, you know, so it brings you in at a fairly high level, GS a nine or 11, and, it, and you can move up from there. And, um, and you can do rotations, up to two rotations for up to three months apiece, I believe, um, and rotation to another part of the government or another part of your own bureau. So, so that's the PMF program. The recent graduate program is similar, but it brings you in at a slightly lower level at like a GS seven. And it's a one-year program as opposed to two, but you still get a rotation and you can apply for that one within two years of graduating. So, so that's why it's um, the recent graduate program. Okay. The internship program. So these are paid internships um, that, that are available through the Pathways program. So the way to apply for these is through usajobs.gov. And the, and the issue is you have to be ready to pounce on them whenever the opportunities open. So you need to sign up on our website where it says keep me informed in the top right hand corner to get the emails for when the positions open. And these positions open one minute after midnight. Eastern Standard Time. And you have to be ready to, to, you need to have your profile already in USA Jobs like Gov with your resume, your transcript and, and, and everything ready to, to apply for a job. And then um, and when they open, you, you have to apply quickly because there's a cap on how many people can apply for these positions. Um, and that's between 50 to 100 people depending on the, on the uh, position. And that typically fills up within the first one to two hours. So you, so you have to be ready to apply and, and you have to move quickly. Um, after you finish one of those programs, the internship, graduate or PMF, then you can convert into a full-time government position. And I will stop there and we'll circle back if there's any questions during the question and answer period. Great, thank you, Mr. Bland, so much. And finally, we'll move on to Ms. Rhonda Sinkfield um, with the US uh, Department of Commerce. Thank you, Kyla. Um, I am breaking government protocol and I don't have a PowerPoint, so, but if you're terribly disappointed, I can send you one. Um, I'm with the Foreign Commercial Service. We are the trade promotion arm of the US Department of Commerce. Um, we have two sides. One is a domestic side, uh, our U.S. commercial service in over 100 cities in the United States. Um, that's, the, that's civil servants. So those application processes are through USA Jobs and as available. Uh, I will spend most of my time talking about the foreign commercial service. Uh, we have an assessment uh, approximately once every two years. Uh, we are a small um, profile compared to our colleagues at state and USAID, uh, but we're located in 75 countries around the world. And we are responsible for commercial affairs. Um, and that includes the promotion of U.S. goods and services, the promotion of U.S. commercial interests, especially for small and medium-sized businesses, and we support the US government's efforts in industry trade analysis. Um, the second part of what we do is we also promote inbound US investment into the United States through a program called Select USA. Um, I, so I'm currently uh, serving in our domestic office in headquarters. I'm a desk officer for Singapore, but I have served in Shanghai and uh, South Africa uh, working with U.S. businesses. Think of us as a consultancy. Our core functions are working with companies to help get their products and services into foreign markets. Um, we do a number of services. There is a fee to uh, U.S. companies uh, for uh, things like market intelligence reports, business matchmaking to help them find a local partner uh, or a local distributor. Uh, and we do non-paid services as well, including trade counseling. So uh, advising them on the market conditions and the viability of their products and services for that particular market. And we do advocacy, which is where we advocate to the foreign government, government on behalf of the US firms, products or services. Um, 
unlike some of the other programs, we do have an application process where minimum qualifications are required. Um, we require three years of specialized experience in um, assisting with production of regional or international market analysis, uh, assisting with the development or implementation of international trade and marketing strategies, assisting in planning and implementation of trade promotion activities, and actively participating in meetings with foreign governments or contributing to analysis of commercial issues requiring trade, economic, or business knowledge of one or more geographic political regions. Um, so we bring in people with some level of experience in these areas. Um, and you can, you can be creative if you've had some uh, exposure to international business or trade policy or trade work um, in a number of ways. We have people who come in, um, this is sort of a sec second career doing um, after they've been in international business for a while. We've had people who've worked for even foreign governments, uh, trade promotion arms in the United States. Um, and, you know, in my case, I came in with a business consulting background and public policy background working in international trade and tax. Um, so there are a number of ways you can gain that experience, and I encourage you to apply. Um, the process is we put an application out on USA Jobs. You complete the application, and then from that process, um, there's a selection of the applications, and then if you pass that selection, you are invited to our assessment. And our assessment covers um, five or six performance dimensions, substantive knowledge, management competence, intellectual competence, interpersonal competence, communication competence, and technical competence. You know, we assume because we require this experience that you come in with an understanding of export promotion programs, uh, including the roles of public and private sector agencies and organizations within that, um, within export promotion. And our uh, oral assessment typically includes structured interview, a group exercise, advocacy exercise program, an in, inbox exercise, and editing exercise program. Um, I will stop there. I know we're, we're limited on time and I do wanna give people uh, a few minutes to answer, ask questions, uh, but I will drop the email address into the chat in terms of if you have more specific questions you can reach out to our uh, human capital office or feel free to ask me questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the panelists who gave amazing presentations today. Um, one thing that I really love about this event is the fact that we're all Black professionals in this space. So um, we're going to start the Q&A session off right now. Um, and the first question that we have is, as Black government officials, can you speak about your experience as a Black individual within government? And did you have to feel like you had to adjust to representing a country that has not always represented or included you? Anybody could answer this question. We're all silent. Uh, really quickly, I, I served as a mission spokesperson, and so step into the podium to um, sometimes advocate for or to that is new. This is older than Ralph Bunch, right? So um, we take an oath to the Constitution and not to a person. That's the first thing you should know and uh, and and remember. So if you feel like I can only do this job if so. frankly, about the, multipli the multiplicity of the I'm sorry, I think you cut out there. Yeah, maybe you can connect. Whether or not we may be conflicted about that, we are still as human as the next person. So I have not been conflicted necessarily. Um, I certainly have been um, in disagreement with some policies and that's, that's the beauty of this, of this process. You need to be at the table to be able to to um, to bring your perspective, to be able to disagree. It's one thing to be talking about it with your friends or whatever, but if you're not in the room where it happens, um, my apologies to Hamilton, then really you're not going to be able to um, to have any impact on any policy.
spaces you're in to do that. Um, I'll just jump in here. I think that you know, I've always felt that being a Black Foreign Service officer worked to my advantage overseas. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, maybe somebody was under, underestimating me or my role. And um, as Rhonda said, I had the opportunity to change their perception on not only what a Black Foreign Service officer, well, sorry, not only what a Foreign Service officer looks like, but on what ability the Black Foreign Service officer brought to the table. Um, you know, and one of the challenges, particularly with USAID, is that when you're in a developing country, you're so involved in what's going on in that country that sometimes you lose touch with a little bit with what's going on back home. And, and I'll be honest to say that I was one of those people, you know, who didn't follow up as much on what was going on back home, who wasn't as engaged in what was going on back in the US. And so when I came back to do my domestic assignment, I was really kind of like caught off guard by how much there was that still needed to be done. And, and it really kind of activated my own personal activism. Um, and so being back in the US has been fantastic for me personally, um, but you know, professionally, it doesn't in, impact your daily life as much as we would like to think it does, or at least that's been my experience. I'll, I'll also chime in and say that that's, um... One challenge that, that I find is just not having enough of us out there, out and about, you know, like there's oftentimes when we're the, the only one at post or the only one at the table, you know, in the room where it happened, like Yolanda said. Um, and it, just sometimes you, you want to have somebody who you have that kind of connection with. Not saying you can't connect with other colleagues, but sometimes there's just things that you want to talk about that that it just helps to have another you know African American person there with you to discuss you know e even like simple things like things that happen from your childhood that maybe you and and this other person may connect on, but when you're posted all the way out in Kazakhstan, nobody's going to be able to connect with that you, you know like nobody around you is going to be able to have that same type of connection so that so that's that's a challenge and there's as Rhonda mentioned there's several teachable moments that can happen. You know, like there's, there's plenty of times when people would just mistake me for being um, just a security person, not, not saying that our security person are not, are not important, but they just automatically assume, oh, oh he's just here to provide security or, you know, or, or he's here to do this other function and not fully taking you on as, as a foreign service officer and, and, and what you can bring to the table. So, I mean, those, those are the types of teachable moments that can be a challenge as well. And those crucial conversations, you know, they, they, they happen for us, which I wish they didn't have to because it's uncomfortable, but, but we deal with it, you know? I mean, we, we do find, we have our employee affinity groups um, within our organizations. We, have, we do find our colleagues who do look like us, you know? And we, and we do collaborate and we, and we, and we conversate and, and, and have these conversations amongst ourselves and we, and we do deal with them. Thank you guys for your amazing responses. Now diving into kind of career-based questions. Um, somebody asked, how could entry-level professionals or students um, kind of connect their experiences to maybe for the State Department, the 13 dimensions, or for these other organizations, the, the, the requirements or what they're looking for in an applicant when they kind of just came out of college? How can they connect their experiences that might not they might not have a lot of with, I guess, the requirements or the things that these departments are looking for um, in new jobs. Nathan? I saw in the chat box that you said you would talk about that later, but all right. <laughs> I'll swing first. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll swing first and then, and then let you follow up. So it doesn't have to come from any specific set of experiences. So if you look at those 13 dimensions, they, they're, they're qualities. They, they are qualities that you can pick up in many parts of your life, like um, composure, leadership, oral communication, written communication, flexibility, you know, cultural adaptability, those types of qualities, right? You can, you can find that in, in, your, in your student life, you can find that in, in your campus jobs or your part-time job. You can find that just in regular life. Like if you moved from one place to another place, 
for school. Like I know, I don't think Kyla is from New Orleans, but she moved down here for, for school, right? That's a whole different culture. And you can talk about how you adapt to the New Orleans culture, you know, as part of cultural adaptability. It's how you tell the anecdotes and how you talk about what you've done and, how, and what results there were from your actions. That's, that's what makes those, those dimensions. I mean, that's the way they test those dimensions is by asking you questions and allowing you to explain how you show this quality. And you, you reflect on your life and, and you tell the stories. I always recommend people to, to think about those dimensions as they go through things. And when something seems like it connects, write it down because it's kind of hard to think about all of those things at one time especially like on the spot, if somebody were to say, tell me about a time you showed leadership and what did you do and what was the situation and how did you change it? You know, it's kind of hard to do that on the spot. So you need to think about these things in advance and, um, and keep a list of times that you've shown these different types of attributes. Yolanda? Very briefly, uh, I was a waitress for three days, the world's worst. So um, if you work in hospitality, um, you talk about composure when people are hangry, you talk about your ability to multitask, you talk about the ability to um, really just how are you keeping this all together. Um, there's a reason I was a waitress for three days. Um, just if you've ever had a leadership position in a, in a college club, then you have some of the strongest diplomatic skills perhaps ever, like having to herd these cats, get people to do what it is that you want them to do. Okay, we've agreed on whatever this thing is and now we're gonna move to the next thing. So it doesn't have to be lofty. I mean, there are not a lot of people who have been diplomats before they become diplomats. So almost everyone comes to this having some other life experience. So think about what, what the question is, you know, when have I had to hold my composure together? Um, when have I had to, you know, display whatever the, the trait is and talk about that? And, you know, sometimes it may be a negative experience. Um, I talked about the fact that I was the world's worst waitress. I know that to be true. And I, I will just add, particularly for FCS, because we do have some specific uh, qualifications for the application, um, anything in international trade, international business um, would uh, account for that. One of the things that in our U.S. Export Assistance Center, so that's our domestic arm of uh, the Foreign Commercial Service, a lot of those offices bring on interns. Uh, they do it independently, so you have to reach out to your local, USIAC is the acronym we call, uh, and ask if they are bringing on interns um, at the particular time. That's a great way to get some direct exposure um, in trade policy, or if you've worked in uh, international marketing or international business, those are opportunities as well that you can leverage. And I just wanted to add from the USAID side, you know, one of the things that I see a lot of students doing, particularly students of color, is discounting their experience, right? And, you know, just going back to what Yolanda and Nathan were saying, don't assume that you're not qualified already, because you know what? Your white colleagues, they're not making that assumption. They're applying for those jobs and they're getting those jobs with the same experience that you have. And so put yourself out there. If you want the job and you know that you can do this job well, then put yourself out there in a position where you can actually get the job. And so that's all I'd say on that one. Thank you all. And I know we are out of time, but if it's okay, could we ask just one more question um, before we end this? Thank you. All. Um, this one question is specific to kind of the State Department once again. Um, how does the process of becoming a generalist in the State Department differ from becoming a specialist in the State Department? Um, and does everybody kind of enter as a generalist? You wanna go? And doesn't enter as a, as a generalist. Uh, Nathan's gonna talk about specials, I'm sure. So again, the, we have not found a particular academic discipline to be a predictor of success when it comes to generalist core, the Foreign Service Officer core, which is why we have the Foreign Service Officer test and that process. Uh, for specialists, um, as the name, the name implies, obviously you have to have certain um, degrees, licensure, and, and certificate certifications before you join. So our, our physicians are indeed physicians. They, um, they are, they've gone to medical school. And so when you come in as a specialist and you have a particular portfolio, it, as the name says, specialist, a, a portfolio that is focused on a particular 
part of, of what it is you're going to be working on, um, we hire for those specialties, including licensure, including certification. Nathan? Let me, let me just add about the generalist part. So we kind of kind of glossed over it during the presentations about how to become a generalist. But there's the foreign service in, in the State Department, there's the foreign service officer test that you have to take. It's offered three times a year, okay? And it's, it's totally free to take the exam. And you can take it as many times as you want to, but you can only take it once a year. Then the only requirements to take it are that you have to be at least 20 years of age when you take the test and you have to be a US citizen. Those are the only requirements. And if you pass the exam, it's a multi-stage exam. First is the foreign service officer test, which is multiple choice, three different sections. Um, there's the English part, there's the job knowledge part, there's a situational judgment part, and there's essays involved. Even when you register, there's a little short narrative that you have to write. And if you pass all of that, then you may be invited to what's called the Foreign Service Oral Assessment, which is really when you need to talk about those 13 dimensions that we were talking about earlier. That's an all day in-person assessment, trying to see how you work in a team, trying to see how you do on an individual case study and a structured interview. And then if you pass that, then you've basically passed, but you, you still have to get your medical clearance and your security clearance. And then you get put on a list and you and then you get brought in to the foreign service when um, when we start forming new classes. Now that's a very quick explanation about the exam, but um, we have sessions on the exam, like whole 30, 30 minute to hour long sessions on the exam to help explain that. If you are um, if you're interested in that, please do check out our website, careers.state.gov. Um, sign up with, with your DIR and you can get more information on that as well. Thank you so much for that answer. And just kind of to, to get to finalize everything, can you guys give your contact information or how they can learn more about your careers um, that you guys are in right now? So I dropped an email address uh, in the chat. Uh, it, uh, if, yeah, cscareers at trade.gov, if you have specific questions about FCS. 